Good morning, everyone. Welcome to SEMDAS Research Webinar, where we have the pleasure of having Rudier, uh, Rudier Bachman, who is a Stefan Famidi Associate Professor of Economics at the University of Notre Dame. And he is also a fellow of the Nanovic Institute for European Studies. Yeah. Rudier Bachman is a research affiliate with the Center for Economic Policy Research. Assess IFO Research Network Fellow and an external research professor at the IFO Institute in Munich. Before joining the University of Notre Dame, Bagman was full professor of behavioral economics and finance, jointly at the Goethe Institute and the Center of Excellence Sustainable Architecture for Finance in Europe, SAFE, in Frankfurt. Uh, Bagman received undergraduate. Uh, degrees in economics and philosophy from Mainz University and a PhD from Yale University in 2007. Bachman also serves as an associate editor for the Economic Journal and is a member of the Macroeconomics Committee of the German Economic Association. Bachman's research area is macroeconomics, where he specializes in the macroeconomics of heterogeneous agents. He is interested in the implications of uncertainty and expectations formation on macroeconomic outcomes. He has published in the American Economic Review, the Journal of Monetary Economics, the American Economic Journal of Macroeconomics, the American Economic Journal of Economic Policy, the Review of Economic Dynamics, the Journal of Money, Credit and Banking, the European Economic Review, Quantitative Economics, Economic Debtors, and Economic Theory. And as you can see uh, today, he is going to be talking about this paper on expectations are observables and we haven't even started yet. So without further ado, let me introduce you to uh, Rudier Bachman. Thank you. All right, thanks so much uh, for inviting me. It's an honor and a pleasure to, to, to talk to you. Um, as Alberto probably told you, we'll ha we're having some uh, technical difficulties, so it's um, either going to be, we have two modes. There's one in which I can't hear you, but apparently you can hear me well, and there's another mode where my mic essentially doesn't work, but where I could hear you talk. So, um, and I'm, we are flexible. So if you have uh, things that you do not want to type or things that, questions that are longer, I can just switch um, uh, to the other mode. It's no problem. Um, and then I'll just shut off my mic, in which case I will be able to hear you. Anyway, apologies for that. We still haven't quite figured out why that happens, but you know, the te technical issues, uh, you know, sometimes just happen. Okay, let's get started. Um, um, this is a, a, a sort of a bit of an overview talk, I think. Expectations are observable, and we haven't even started yet. By the way, I should say, or what you can see behind me, I'm actually not at the University of Notre Dame, although that's my main affiliation. Uh, instead, uh, I'm in my, of, uh, my wife's office at the University of Michigan, just in case you're wondering. Anyway, this is an, uh, uh, an overview talk. It's meant to be an overview uh, talk, uh, which has sort of three parts. Uh, the first, I'm going to go a bit into the history of thought um, uh, 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 about expectations, about expectational data. Then I will uh, show you some recent work by others, some of which I, I, I have been told have been also participant in this webinar series, uh, and by myself later on about uh, expectations and what we have learned from expectations, I think, expectational data, that is. And then I will, in the last part, if I get to it, I will push uh, this whole agenda a bit further and will argue that be besides expectations, data, expectational data, which are obviously great and by no means, uh, you know, uh, uh, we are not, not by no means, by any means fully done with them, um, we, I will argue that there might be other data similar to expectational data that uh, economists might use. And I'll give you an example in my own research, okay? So this is not a talk about household survey with what I call objective data, sort of data that, you know, are akin to balance sheet data, national accounting data, stuff like that, okay? Obviously, macroeconomics has benefited tremendously from such data. Uh, if you think in the United States, the PSID, the SIP, the CES, the CPS, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we have learned about the nature of income risk from this uh, data, income wealth and consumption inequality, life cycle economics, labor market flows, disaggregate consumption behavior, 
the Income, Wealth, Consumption, Nectars, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Um, and this is not what this talk about is about. Um, and again, this is not to say that these other uh, survey data haven't, haven't uh, uh, brought tremendous progress in economics, but it's just about something else. So this talk will be, will be about what I will call sort of subjective data, okay? Expectations in, in the first part, and then sort of more attitudinal or reasons data where economic agents actually tell us why they did a certain thing. Um, and I think those, that's sort of, that's an agenda that's a bit dear to me, which I'm trying to push uh, a bit. But that's sort of the third part of the, of the talk, okay? Um, let's start with the expectation uh, data. That's sort of, I understand the theme also of the webinar series. And let's sort of, you know, step back a bit and think about uh, the history of thought, okay? I mean, obviously, no one will, no one since, uh, I don't know, uh, ex uh, will contend that expectations are crucial in economics. Okay, I'm not an expert in the history of thought, but probably, you know, when Ricardo was uh, arguing, which then led to the Ricardian equivalence argument, whether, you know, uh, a war should be bond and tax finance, uh, that argument is a simple expectational argument, obviously. You all know uh, what's behind Ricardian uh, equivalence, the way we teach it to undergraduates. Right? That's sort of a simple, a simple, that's the first thing I could come up with. Again, I'm not an historian uh, of thought. Maybe Adam Smith also has something in there. So no one will deny that, okay? Um, and I would argue that why is it crucial in economics? Because um, at a deep philosophical level, our object of inquiry is, is very different from, say, you know, uh, data uh, or the natural sciences, right? Our uh, objects of inquiry, economic agents have a sense of the future and make decisions with information about the future and relevance for the future, right? If you want uh, uh, sort of a, um, and you know, particles and physics just don't have that. That's why expectations in economics are obviously crucial. If you want to use um, uh, uh, a fancy German philosopher uh, 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 statement about this, I think it's a, uh, it's a bit arcane language, but it's sort of, it's precisely what, what I mean by this, is uh, Heidegger has this sentence in Being in Time, where he says, an existential of Dasein, Dasein is essentially human beings, is temporality. Dasein is care being ahead of itself. So we all, human beings, always live partially in the future. So this is a very, this is basically uh, just simply uh, uh, the human condition in some sense, at a very abstract philosophical level. So it used to be, so we all agree that expectations are important from a theoretical point of view. And it also used to be that expectations and expectation formation in particular was a very respectable object of empirical study in economics, okay? Um, just to give you one example, and that's already, at around that time, this is already sort of an older example of things. But if you look in the 1950s, 60s, even 70s, and then maybe, um, sort of Mark Nerloff's paper in Econometrica, which is really a presidential address uh, of uh, one of the meetings of the econometric societies. Basically, it's called Expectations, Plans, and Realizations in Theory and Practice, where he uses certain firm-level survey data to address whether expectations are formed rationally or not. So, you know, the, the, the study of expectation formation, um, be, when we still had a debate between is it rational expectations or some other form of expectation formation, like adaptive expectations, was a, a very honest to God, uh, uh, you know, exercise to do in economics, okay? Um, so what happened, okay? What happened since then? Because I would argue, at least from most academic research until very recently, you know, studying this uh, this question, expectations, expectation formation, both on the firm and the household side, have been, you know, have been a bit um, neglected, uh, in a, in a, in a, or haven't been what they used to be, okay? So, to me, I think there has always been, and I think this has been, uh, uh, for a while, uh, uh, overwhelmed uh, economics, uh, the methodology of economics, um, there's a very strong, what I would call a behaviorist tradition in economics, okay? In other words, you probably all have ha heard economists say, uh, what people say they do is irrelevant, only what people do matters, right? You, a, lo a lot of, especially somewhat older economists would tell you that and would subscribe to that view, okay? Um, 
And this goes back pretty much all the way to the real preference approach in microeconomics. This is very much linked to the to a more general uh, behaviorist tradition in social science, I would argue. And then the second sort of part of that, of that critique was the rational expectations revolution, of course. Why? Because, as you know, um, in, within a rational expectations environment, basically the expectations come for free. They're given by the model itself, right? Or rather, the physical environment of the model and the stochastic makeup of that physical environment, they deliver what the expectations have to be. They just have to be the best expectations given the model. So the model gives the expectations, okay? And then what happened is, um, in a sense, all you needed to do is test the model, okay? And then with rational expectations, um, you know, they were basically the expectational data were taken somewhat off the table. No one actually wanted to, uh, to, 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 to really look at the expectational uh, implications of these models because we could take the, just perfectly test them with, you know, standard data, national account data, other sort of more hard objective survey data, okay? Um, and basically, if you bring the two together, um, I mean, of course, even rational expectations model could obviously be tested on expectational data. There's nothing, there's nothing uh, that uh, speaks in principle against that. Um, and some people have done this, but of course, if you combine the rational expectations revolution with the behaviorist skepticism about, you know, such expectational, such, sub, such subjective data, what happened basically was that the, the behaviorist streak basically told us, just get rid of this uh, suspicious data, right? We don't believe them anyway, you know, we have hard data, um, let's stick with that. And that's how we could test our models, that was perfectly sufficient. Um, and and that, that was the end of it in some sense, okay? So we, what we obviously did, we ended up testing big rational expectations, often DSG models on objective outcome data, okay? Um, So-called objective out data. So what happened to these expectational data, and you know, depending on how long you guys have been in the business, so to speak, they were often left to sort of practitioners to business cycle forecasters and central bank think tanks, business economists, which often, as you unfortunately know, probably academic economists sometimes tend to look down on, undeservedly so, okay? So this was something that practitioners did, basically. But, you know, things have changed a bit, and probably it has to do something with the, with the crisis, the, uh, the, the financial crisis and the Great Recession, um, and then in connection, uh, uh, a lot of people would, people would argue that economics or macroeconomics at least itself was in a bit in a, of a crisis. For one thing we learned, uh, and probably practitioners knew this all along, but certainly from Barsky and Sims, uh, a, a AR article, Information, uh, uh, Animal Spirits and the Meaning of Innovations in Consumer Confidence, that these uh, survey level da uh, data basically uh, do contain uh, predictive information about the business cycle, okay? So these are not noise, but they, they mean something, even, even when controlling for other so-called hard data. And, you know, the more recent developments, I would argue that this sort of behaviorist orthodoxy is a bit less predominant. And a lot of economists, subgroup of economists, not just me, but others too, I know you have talked to or will talk to Oli Koibion and Jorgo Nichenko have been pushing this agenda also quite a bit um, to use other stuff uh, as data, as, as respectable data that, you know, that we can use and can, can get, uh, uh, you know, information from, okay? So maybe, you know, maybe we don't like to admit it as economists, but maybe we have learned a bit from our friends in the political science and sociology where I would argue that the behaviorist orthodoxy has never been so predominant and certainly has come much earlier under criticism. Of course, I am not going to deny, I'm not going to give you sort of a, a heterodox perspective or anything. I'm as mainstream an economist as there is, I think, I hope at least. But, you know, um, rational expectations are an important benchmark, uh, a first pass, a default, that I don't think we should give up. But I don't think e either that uh, they are the alpha and omega of economics. So I think we have become a bit more liberal about that. And there's a recent, a recent article of Ricardo Reich, which basically another very mainstream economist who, would, who basically touts the same horn here, 
okay? And the third development, I would argue, is that economists uh, see value, e again, I think, in testing not entire large, essentially DSG models at the same time, technically speaking, sort of full information uh, testing and estimation of, 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 of models, but economists have now gone back to a bit of an earlier school uh, of thought uh, where, you know, we try to focus a bit more on certain key elements or modules of them and try to get that test right in some sense, right? So this is the way we have been doing things a bit in earlier times, you know, think of the, the multitude of PIH tests in the literature, which is basically estimating one aspect of a large DSGE RBC type of model, okay? And sort of economists are more, at least for, for empirical testing, I would argue, are often much more content again to sort of stick to more partial equilibrium, if you want, want to use that word, um, uh, setups. Okay? Those are the th uh, three recent developments, I would argue, that have made the, the behaviorist slash rational expectation paradigm a bit less uh, um, important. Not that we, we got rid of it totally, and I would never dream to argue we should get rid of it. It's just uh, it has just become less less uh, important or less predominant. Okay, um, and I guess psychologically this is uh, this has certainly been triggered by you know the the because of recent macroeconomic events. I think the field has a more general openness, willingness to rethink the foundation of us. Okay. Um, Another sort of uh, quote from Nayana Kochilakota, uh, which is, uh, as you probably know, now at Rochester, but former Minnesota economist, freshwater economist, um, uh, and he has changed gears quite a bit. He's now uh, arguably, if anything, uh, uh, an arch Keynesian uh, or, or something like that. But anyway, he says in this little piece on thoughts on the trouble with microeconomics, uh, recent piece, we need to encourage those who are trying to learn more about how people actually form expectations. At the same time, we need to be a lot more flexible in our thinking about models and theory so that we can be firmly grounded in the improved, improved um, uh, empirical understanding. And again, you know, still, uh, no one would doubt that Akotra Lakota is a very mainstream uh, great economist, the same with Ricardo Reich in a recent piece. And so um, uh, this is even sort of the highest echelons of our profession are at least some of them are now uh, subscribing to this to this uh, uh, view. Okay, so that concludes the history of thought. The next few minutes, just want to go through a bunch of examples and uh, that you probably have heard of uh, yourself. I know, as I said, that at least one of these guys has been uh, or will be part of this webinar series. Um, uh, and I'm just going to go quickly through um, a bunch of examples uh, of others. Uh, what we've learned uh, through expectation data before I will talk a bit more about my own research, okay? Um, okay, perfect, yeah, presented last uh, uh, Wednesday, exactly. So I can be quick about this, although I, I think he, this is earlier work, um, uh, so, um, so this might still be interesting. So what, uh, um, what, uh, what they do is, um, uh, for example, this is a paper from the Journal of Political Economy, where they use, among others, the Michigan Survey of Consumers and the Survey of Professional Forecasters. They use data on inflation expectations to essentially test serious informational rigidities. Right? They basically want to know, um, um, uh, is it full information? Are the data consistent with full information? Is it more sort of a rational inattention type story, uh, which is more about sort of there's always an adjustment of expectations, but not never fully? Or, or is this more sort of a sticky information type model, a la Mencu and Riesch, where, where few agents uh, adjust um, and some never and some don't adjust in any given period, but then those who adjust actually get to the full information benchmark. Is, so what is it? Okay, and um, it's pretty clear that expectations react very gradually to news, which uh, right there it rules out in some sense full information models, and then sort of within the imperfect information models. The question, as I said, was: Is it is it more sort of a uh, a noisy information model, which you know, broadly speaking, often people have modeled as rational, rational intention, or is it more sort of a sticky information paradigm? And they argue that a, a very simple data fact, in a sense, that's what the I mean, the paper is a bit more sophisticated, but at the end of the day, 
uh, what we see is that uh, disagreement in inflation forecasts does not seem to respond to shocks uh, very much, which in some sense rules out at least uh, uh, lit taken literally sticky information versions of the world, right? A sticky information view of the world. Because in a sticky information world, some would actually have perfect inflation expectations or would know essentially going back to the rational uh, uh, expectations benchmark, some would just update at all. Uh, and so you would see, you know, with shocks, you know, there should be uh, um, there should be some uh, after some time there should be a disagreement uh, 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 flaring up, right? Because some are very good, well informed, and some others are not. They just don't see this. Versus in noise information models, is more the case that people are always updating, um, um, but uh, in a noisy way. Okay, and so you get very simple baseline statistics that tell us uh, sort of what probably is, should be our view of the world. Of course, this is as always preliminary evidence. But I think it's a very stark evidence uh, in favor of a particular view of imperfect information models. Okay. Uh, first example. Another example is uh, again by the same authors in the American Economic Journal, uh, Macroeconomics, uh, where they ask, "Is the Phillips curve alive uh, uh, and well after all?" Okay. And here, basically, what they argue is that they use inflation expectations data to save the, the traditional Phillips curve argument. Okay, um, and sort of here, I don't know how well you can see this, but I can use the drawing point here. Basically, the, they are asking about the the um, the, the so-called miss, missing information, uh, missing inflation puzzle. So one way of seeing this is down here in this uh, in the in the graph is that um, that uh, actual inflation. Um, tanked uh, is sort of in a very short period uh, uh, in the year 2008, but then inflation came back um, quite a bit, and you know while it while it fluctuated around, its level wasn't then um, too far away from. Um, no, uh, let me let me back let me back up. It was in fact higher than what a backward-looking Phillips curve, at least for a while. It was in fact higher than what a back, simple backward-looking Phillips curve would have predicted, uh, which is basically just about a sort of a slack argument. You know, how much slack is there in the economy? And so we should have seen um, a much lo a much lower inflation, in fact negative inflation, um, uh, in uh, at least sort of the 2009-2010 years. Obviously, from mid-2011, you know, the 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 the, 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 the actual inflation and the one predicted by the Phillips curve. They coincide much more. So this has been a, a lot has triggered a lot of debate in the United States um, uh, about uh, you know can we use, sort of use traditional Phillips curve type thinking you know where inflation is somehow correlated to slack, okay? And um, and the fact uh, it, the answer is in a sense no you can't um, or not just uh, just mechanically um, because we should have seen much lower inflation in fact negative deflation. Um, uh, uh, in the aftermath of the crisis, okay? And you can see this in the upper panel of that picture as well, uh, where sort of certain points just don't conform to a traditional Phillips curve. However, what uh, uh, Kolbe and Gorinchenko argue is um, when, once you put inflation expectation data from the Michigan uh, survey, which is household, to be fair, household inflation expectation data, um, um, into a Phillips curve estimation, this is exactly what you, then the data make a lot of sense because household expectations didn't actually fall all that much. They were pretty well anchored. And so what happened is that, uh, and in fact, they, uh, you know, we had a bit of an oil price shock too. And so, you know, households actually perceived higher infl uh, 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 inflation in the data. And that explains essentially why actual inflation also didn't fall as much as from a purely backward looking flag type of argument, uh, a Phillips curve, okay? And uh, they have to make this assumption because unfortunately, and this is why they do now what you saw in the uh, 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 Olivier present, they, they are using the New, uh, New Zealand Central Bank uh, to, to figure out what are actually the inflation expectations of firms. In that paper, in the uh, AJ Macro paper, they had to make the assumption that inflation expectations somehow reflect expectations, inflation expectations of firms as well. And, uh, and so under that assumption, they can perfectly uh, explain uh, the actual inflation data with 
sort of an expectation augmented Phillips curve time to, type of argument, essentially. That's what they're doing. Okay? Um, all right. Another paper by uh, another set of authors, uh, uh, Cavallo and Necho, 2014, in the Journal of Monetary Economics. Um, they use, again, Michigan household expectation data on inflation, interest rates, and unemployment to see whether people understand sort of basic mechanics of the Taylor Rule now. Not the Phillips curve, but the Taylor Rule, okay? Obviously, this is important for any central bank. It's going to be important for you guys. You know, if people don't understand what, what you're trying to do, you know, this is a major communication challenge. Um, and actually, they find that the results are broadly consistent with the view that U.S. households are aware, at least of the, they don't understand maybe the, you know, the, the intricate details of a Taylor rule and you know, exactly what the numbers are on the reaction coefficients, but they're basically aware of the basic principles underlying the Taylor rule when they form their interest rates and their expectations about interest rates, inflation, and unemployment. Um, and they also find uh, higher income and higher education households more so. Okay. So it's, uh, it's reassuring uh, for our economics education in the United States. Um, and they also show that um, uh, they find that, that, that agents are basically in particularly uh, in line with sort of Taylor rule type arguing or Taylor rule type reasoning when labor markets are weak which sort of gets a bit at a rational inattention story. In other words, when it really matters, people do pay attention to monetary policy in some sense. Okay. Um, that one I can skip. I think that is something that Oli has presented. That's sort of one of their earlier papers on the, the New, Zealand, New Zealand firms. Um, but just to remind you what the basic thrust of that paper is, they find basically that inflation expectations in one of the first countries that introduced officially inflation targeting is not uh, anchored at all. Okay. And the managers seem to be very unaware of uh, inflation, of central banks' of, uh, 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 objectives and inflation dynamics. And the final paper, others, and I promise then I'll go back to my own research, is sort of a recent uh, working paper out of, the, out of the New York Fed. They have a new survey, which I think, if you haven't heard of it, I think is a great, uh, uh, has some improvements of the Michigan survey. The Michigan survey will just be always important because of its time series aspect. This is a very short survey that they just started a couple of years ago, but it's a, a survey of consumer expectations run out of the New York Fed, uh, and the data are essentially publicly available, even the microdata. Um, and they have things like, uh, for example, they have direct data on consumption growth or expected consumption growth and inflation expectations. And they basically can is estimate more or less directly from survey data an oil equation. And in particular, what they're after is, you know, there's this huge older literature trying to estimate the elasticity of intertemporal substitution, or conversely, the risk aversion parameter, which obviously is a key macro, both of them are key macroeconomic parameters. I don't think I need to uh, uh, elaborate on that. And, you know, the literature, the results are depending on how you estimate it, whether you estimate the intertemporal elasticity of intertemporal substitution directly, or the risk aversion parameter, you know, they vastly differ. There's essentially, you can no little consensus of what that, that parameter should be, okay? Um, um, and so what's crucial here is that they actually have subjectively expected consumption growth from these guys. And so while the literature has, for lack of expectational data, usually estimated to the extent that they have estimated them on oil equations on realized consumption growth, uh, the, the sort of the gold standard in the literature is uh, the work by Atanasio and Weber, um, but they, in some sense, had to presuppose rational expectations, right? Uh, they had to presuppose that, on average, um, uh, expected consumption growth is uh, real, realized consumption growth plus, a, plus an IID noise term, essentially, right? So they had to um, presuppose rational expectations. And they do this and find, basically, uh, that, uh, you know, that, uh, that um, I forgot exactly what the number was, but it's sort of a, a, their estimate, their preferred estimate falls in sort of the, the the standard uh, uh, parameter values we like to put into our model for the elasticity of substitution. So just taking stock, what do we learn from these recent, uh, re uh, recent examples in the literature? And they're really recent, right? And, uh, pretty much all of them are uh, past 2010, I would, uh, if, I, if I remember correctly. Um, so what can we do with expectation data? Okay. And um, just to really repeat things, it informs, it informs the literature on informational rigidities. 
it informs a major current monetary policy puzzle like missing deflation, okay, and tests in the process the validity or the sh the shape of or, or the, the the makeup of a Phillips curve. Okay. Do we need expectation or augmentation, for example, stuff like that? We can test with them whether the public understands monetary policy, Taylor rules, for one thing, or uh, inflation anchoring in the sense of uh, in the sense of um, uh, um, from that New Zealand uh, paper or that uh, New Zealand research agenda by Kolbe and Gordonachenko. Okay, and this is obviously something that should be dear to all of you working at a central bank. Okay, we can test the oil equation. This is an example of what I mentioned before that economists again are back to the sort of the older makeup of uh, uh, research uh, uh, questions where we take particular important elements of some larger models and try to figure out you know, try to learn about their validity uh, in a much more partial equilibrium setting before we then put them back into big general equilibrium models. And again, uh, this is not arguing against general equilibrium models, but it's maybe arguing for a more sort of piece by piece uh, testing, uh, 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 more focused piece by piece testing of some of the elements, key elements of some of the larger models. Okay. So this is what you can do with it. Okay. All right. Now, basically, to the second part of the pre uh, uh, presentation, where I want to talk a bit about my own work, uh, the paper that has been published in the AJ uh, uh, Policy uh, a couple of years ago, where I look at the uh, the connection, or we were really the first to look at the connection between inflation expectations and spending, and this has since triggered um, uh, a, a a bit of a, a bit of an industry, a small cottage industry doing this in other settings and other empirical settings. Um, but maybe this is a good time um, to, to, uh, to pause here and ask whether you have any questions about the, um, 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 uh, uh, about the first part, sort of the history of thought part. And if so, I'm happy to switch the mic. Okay, doesn't seem to be the case. Of course, you can interrupt me anyway uh, as we go along, uh, seminar style in principle, with with the, the technical caveats, obviously. All right. Um, so, in not not really just a neo Keynesian model, but that's obviously one that we a lot of us like to use for monetary policy question. But in a large class of models, um, the the way is, and, and and quite differently from sort of old Keynesian ISLM type of thinking. Uh, the neo keynesian model, the stabilization policy, works essentially almost always through inflation expectations, right? Monetary policy, especially at the zero lower bound, um, uh, the argument is, is uh, what the monetary policy has to do, say with forward guidance, is to manipulate inflation expectations so as to um, uh, up, so as to reduce the real interest rate, and that will then lead to more demand and spending. Right? That's the that's the basic idea. Similarly, fiscal. How does fiscal policy work in a neo Keynesian model? Um, like the changes in. I will come back to that. Uh, VAT taxes or changes in uh, in government spending. It's all about driving up inflation expectations at the end of the day. So it, it, there's this sort of eye of the needle um, that uh, that you have to work through inflation expectations um, to to uh, to um, to uh, to spur aggregate demand, okay. And again, uh, let me remind you, this is sort of very different from the old Keynesian thinking, which is all about someone, the government spends, you know, someone has more income, um, they're going to spend this on consumption, and then we get these multiplier effects and stuff like that. That's sort of a that's sort of the, the the stuff that we sometimes still teach our undergrads, but mostly we we don't have this in our models actually, okay. And sort of. Various channels of this of this uh, of this flowchart have been tested by now. Uh, by now. For example, there's a, a very neat paper by Bill Dupour uh, at the at the St. Louis Fed who t uh, teaches the, the the upper right uh, uh, who tests the upper right uh, uh, arrow, namely from fiscal policy to inflation expectations, using the Obama fiscal stimulus, 
and he essentially finds nothing. Okay, he essentially argues uh, delta G had no uh, impact on inflation expectations whatsoever. So what we did, and we started this a bit earlier, I think, we actually test this last, the lower, the lower uh, um, uh, arrow, and just want to know basic facts about what do we know from survey data about. Uh, the connection, the nexus, really, between inflation expectations and uh, demand at the household level. This is actually important, at the household level, given um, uh, what you know from, from Olivier about the, 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 the state of survey data in the United States, we just don't have uh, inflation expectations firm level data. It is what it is, okay? Um, so what, sort of, if you zoom into that arrow and sort of ask yourself, um, what 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 sort of how inflation expectations would would uh, would change uh, aggregate demand? Well, obviously the, the the most important is the real interest rate channel, especially when you have essentially a zero nominal interest rate. Con what what matters is the constant nominal interest rate, uh, which we know has a good reason to be constant at zero. Right? There's also, of course, in a more heterogeneous environment, you have real debt distribution perfectly uh, potentially if you. If you have money, money essential in the model, you know there's an inflation tax, and there could be um, uh, could be a sort of a, an economic policy trust confidence slash uncertainty argument in the sense that, you know, if if the central bank starts inflating too much, you know they're basically losing it. They're losing control over the economy. Okay, and that is sort of an uh, Mirko Wiederhold has a paper that basically says so if if the uh, in an imperfect information world, and if people believe that the central bank has better information than themselves, you know, if if um, it could very well be that uh, higher inflation or higher inf or a drive by the central bank to compute to engineer higher inflation expectations could essentially convey the opposite message, because they basically say now they are resorting to unconventional monetary policy, and so now the shit really hit the fan, basically, to say it bluntly. Um, and, uh, and and the central bank just signals then uh, you know uh, uh, things things are really bad okay and then it can have the exact opposite that you would have in a standard neo Keynesian model okay so that, that that's sort of the the, 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 the the storytelling we lie we have in different models how you know inflation inflation expectations the engineering of of these uh, inflation expectations by central banks could ultimately affect aggregate demand. Um, to just give you sort of uh, uh, two quotes, essentially, that, that simply show that, um, you know, that this is not something that, you know, I've made up or something that this was actually in the policy debate. Here's a quote on National Public Radio from Ken Rogoff. Uh, they need to be willing, in fact, actively, they, the Fed, um, in fact, actively pursue letting inflation rise a bit more. That would encourage consumption. It would encourage investment. And it m maybe m more importantly, Christy Roma in the New York Times article, I forgot whether she was CA at the time, uh, head of the CEA, the Council of Economic Advisors in the United States at the time. Um, but uh, anyway, she's an obviously very prominent both academic and policy-making economist, at least was under the Obama administration. She basically says another possible effect is a temporary climate inflation expectation. Ordinarily, this would be undesirable. But in the current situation, where nominal interest rates are constrained because they can't go below zero, a small increase in expected inflation could be helpful. It would lower real borrowing costs and encourage spending on big ticket items like cars, homes, and big business equipment. There you go. This is essentially what we're trying to test in this paper. Uh, the last uh, uh, piece of sort of introduction, this is such an intuitive channel in some sense that even uh, you can find this even in literature. In the literature, so I um, uh, um, looked this up. As a, uh, this is a German uh, novelist, a German Jewish novelist, Leon Feuchtwanger, who wrote uh, the Oppermanns, um, and I'm quoting from the English translation here, which is basically a, um, a sort of ri plays right around the usurping of power of the Nazi Party in, in January 1993, and it's about a Jewish uh, business uh, uh, man, a furniture salesman, to, to be precise, Markus Oppermann. Um, and so he writes about uh, uh, sort of in a stream of consciousness, consciousness not, not, not consciousness, but he writes about uh, sort of his business dealings with, uh, denti with his own dentists and clients. And here's what he says. But he could have paid the balance of 25, mark, uh, 25 marks at any time and thus, thus made uh, the teeth his own. And so he just got his teeth made apparently by his dentist. 
if he did not, so he didn't pay for it. If he did not do so, it was because he had heard from many people that the accession of the nationalists to power would be followed by inflation of currency. So he just, you know, he thought if the currency inflates later, why should I pay my debt now? I'm going to pay later, and it's less in real terms. So you know, it's a very intuitive argument. And then a bit further in the in the book, and yet business was better than one might ex have expected during this rather quiet winter season. The talk of inflation induced many people to spend their money on household needs instead of putting it in the savings bank. There you go. This is sort of standard debt redistribution arguments and um, and standard Neo Keynesian arguments in a in a in a book in a in a novel you know written in the in the in the 1930s I guess. Okay. Okay. So what do we do? So we do something very simple, and you can criticize it a lot, and it has been criticized in the literature for good reason. But what we, what we basically do, we just wanted to know from basic microdata from the Michigan Survey of Consumers, we wanted to know the association even, just forget about causality, um, the association between a respondent's quantitative inflation expectations and their readiness to buy durable car and houses. That's what we really have. Um, so this is, a, again, another example where we're trying to sort of test a key micro relationship rather than a whole model in some sense. Okay. Um, the Michigan Survey of uh, uh, Monthly Data, we start our sample in 1984, sort of to be outside of the sort of the Volcker era or the Volcker era, the Volcker revolution having settled. Um, it's about 500 households each month. Month. There's also a bit of a, a small panel dimension into it in that sen the sense that a few households are actually re-interviewed once at least six months later. We do a bit of outline, outlier cleaning. Um, um, sort of due diligence uh, here, but what's important is we use two questions. Um, uh, 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 we don't have actual spending data, unfortunately, okay, um, but we do have, um, um, so we are in some sense, uh, uh, you know, subject to the, to the behaviorist, uh, if you wish, uh, criticism. But anyway, the, the, the question we use mainly is uh, about, um, about durables, whether people think it's a good time now for them to buy, uh, uh, you know, these household durables. And then we use as a base, in the baseline one-year inflation expectations, namely by what, by about what percent do you expect future prices to go up down on the average during the next 12 months, okay? Just to give you a bit of an impression of these data, this is how the buying dur durable uh, conditions for durable goods uh, sort of looks in the aggregate. It has sort of the usual properties in the sense that, you know, it's counter cyclical, although it's kind of leading, you know, um, uh, this is kind of a useful, maybe a useful way to actually predict recessions. But uh, ultimately, it, uh, it, is, it is what it's supposed to be. It's a, it's a pro cyclical uh, uh, index. Here's just to sort of as a sanity chest to see whether these. Um, uh, readiness to spending data from the survey actually correlate with a real consumption expenditures, aggregate consumption expenditures on durable from NIPA data. And you know, the R squared is not, not perfect, but there is a clearly a positive significant slope, and you know, so it's a cloud that is positive. You know, so these, these data do capture some stuff. Um, and then we use some alternative questions too, although the durable is the main part, but you have some uh, alternative questions which talks about cars, and also about houses, your willingness to buy houses, and sometimes we also use the long-run inflation expectations, uh, the one between five and ten years. Okay. Yes, sort of credit market imperfection is a, it, it, I mean, it's difficult to measure, but we will, at least we will have ways to control for, for these issues in the sense that we can ask them about their, financial, about their financial situation at least and whether they have trouble borrowing and stuff like that. So if you just do the very bare bones, uh, bare bones uh, thing and just plot you know, the cross-sectional correlation between, um, you know, are you is it a good time to buy durables and your inflation expectations? Um, uh, and you do this month by month, okay? Or I think this is actually yearly data uh, um, to smooth it out a bit. 
um, with um, with uh, the Dorbos question, it's a negative, mostly a negative, and in fact, even here, significant correlation. You can do the same for cars, and you can do the same for houses. Okay, the numbers are not big. Right, these are these are micro data. Don't forget that. So the numbers are never big, but to the extent that there is something, if anything, this is negative, and so this doesn't quite fit the story, right? So because this is says the higher inflation expectation, uh, the more the less likely you are to 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 buy stuff. Okay. Now this is raw correlation. This is not controlled for anything. You know, there could be many many other issues, um, but that's just what the data basically show. Okay. But you can also, this is nice, and this is sort of foreshadowing the third part of the paper, where agents are actually asked about reasons. And so the, the, the Michigan survey has an, uh, an add-on, which also asks you about reasons for buying durables, or for buying a car, or for buying a house, or reasons for not buying them, okay? So, um, so if you look at this, and I, I grant you it's a bit difficult to actually see, you, you just have to believe me, um, you know, the, the, um, the importance of prices going up, okay, for buying durables is, is very rarely an important uh, reason, okay? It's um, uh, uh, reasons for buying durables, for example, get the, here is um, it's mostly, it's a buyer's market. Prices are low now. This is the third important reason is basically with interest rates going up. On the other side, not buying, buying pri uh, durables that prices are going down, uh, you know, again, plays hardly a role. And this is mainly true here and here for houses and cars and also for the negative side. Prices going down, uh, being uh, expected to go down, being a reason for not buying now, hardly. So while something is there, you know, there doesn't seem to be sort of People don't think of it that way. The basic way we think of, uh, uh, we think that Asians in these neo-Keynesian models and other models actually work, okay? Um, that's just, again, some prima facie evidence. Okay, but what do we do uh, then? Obviously, this is not enough to convince anyone, um, but, you know, what we do next is we just, um, you know, do something slightly more sophisticated, we run audit profits. So we basically, we, we basically uh, regress in an audit profit framework um, the, the, whether it's a good time to, to buy durables or cars or, or, or houses um, on inflation expectations. Inflation expectations crossed with a, a dummy for the zero lower bound because the argument would be that this effect, uh, the, the positive effect should especially be there in a zero lower bound argument, uh, environment where you don't have sort of, you know, potentially tailorable effects and then a bunch of other uh, 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 controls that I will talk about later. And so the coefficients of interest are obviously beta 1, and in particular beta 2. That's the, the most important one. That's what we are interested in. Okay. Um, so here's the baseline uh, uh, um, specification with a lot of controls. I'll show you the controls on the, on the next slide. But basically, you find an essentially uh, 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 uncorrelated uh, uh, effect outside the zero-low bound, and the uh, Statistically significant, but very small marginal. Of, don't, don't look at the coefficients, just look at the marginal effect. Uh, they are just tiny, okay? Um, they're statistically significant, which has just to do with the fact that we have uh, tons of observations over time, but it's just, um, it, just, uh, it just doesn't play much of a role. If anything, but if anything, it's negative, okay? It's not people with high inflation expectations tend to, to buy more stuff. So here's what we control for. We have a lot of covariates, other expectational data, things like the expected financial situation of the household here, household real income, change in nominal interest rate, aggregate, their, their own expectations about aggregate business conditions, expected unemployment, the current financial situation, policy trust. They basically have all the coefficients, all statistically significant, and they basically have marginal effects that are, you know, um, that are a bit more sizable, uh, and in particular, they go all in the in the expected direction, right? If you have more household income, better expected financial situation, uh, you know, if aggregate business, business conditions are good, expect them to be good, then it's uh, the current financial situation being good, then you basically are more willing to spend, okay? Um, so this is uh, controlling for a bunch of aggregate stuff, um, which uh, we also do something with time-fixed effects, but 
if you're willing to control for aggregate effect, they're also more or less reasonable. Basically, what so first of all, this is kind of interesting because this shows you that the, the survey data are not crap. Except for the inflation expectations variable, pretty much all other variables you stick in there have exactly the sign, at least, of the marginal effect. Basic economic theory would suggest it should have, right? So there's something there. This is not crap. This is not just noise, okay? This is a, a good in, uh, sanity check. And then this is more, I put this up more for fun because, you know, you can, you can uh, chat about this with, uh, with your wife. It's basically, you can see that in a sort of from a fixed effect point of view almost, um, it is the case that uh, it's, uh, it's young white males uh, that tend to have, the, on average, the highest inclination to buy durables. Okay, big shocker. Uh, I guess we all knew that. Um, anyway, um, and then we do a bunch of robustness checks. You can throw five-year inflation expectations in there. You can do this by year. You can estimate this sort of by year, not just overall. Um, you can uh, uh, estimate this, you know, ac across different demographic subgroups. By the way, unlike uh, uh, the paper about um, uh, about the Taylor rule, we don't find any difference between income age, uh, income and uh, education. We also don't find any difference between age and birth, different birth cohorts. Um, it's basically the same thing. Um, a few other things we do: we can't do much in terms of fixed effects. I mean, partly, partly what these many controls are supposed to do is sort of getting at fixed effects. Uh, like things like, okay, there are some pessimistic households always expect low growth and therefore high exp in inflation expectations, have high inflation expectations, and so they're just always the grumps, and that's why they don't buy stuff, right? Um, partly, we can control for this with sort of many, many of these other expectational data. We also play around a bit with the panel dimension um, and sort of doing something like a fixed effect regression, which you can't quite do in a non-linear setting like a, an audit, uh, an audit probit, but you can do some similar stuff and we find it doesn't make a difference. So it's not driven by this sort of permanent cross-sectional heterogeneity. Um, okay. So you also find this um, um, uh, when you look at houses. Unfortunately, some of these samples get much smaller because the housing questions came in later. But what's kind of interesting here, so you can, you can, um, Give me here. So the the the, the uh, sorry. So the 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 marginal effect for inflation uh, stays essentially the same. But here's interest. Here's something interesting because we actually have expected change in house prices. And here clearly you see the positive effect. So in the sense that households do understand relative prices. Okay. They seem to understand if house prices are expected to go up, better buy now. Okay. So that is the connection they do make. Again, relative prices we only have for house prices in particular. We just don't have it for the car questions and the durable questions. So that's another sort of insight you can, you can see. Um, and another interesting thing that you can see is, so then we try to sort of control this for um, reasonable and aggregate inflation expectations. Reasonable inflation expectations are sort of down here, sort of expectation inflation uh, that sort of uh, within a certain amount of mean inflation expectations or within a certain range of professional forecast uh, inflation expectations, that, you know, it doesn't make much of a difference. Um, but we see when we look at aggregate, aggregate inflation expectations, in and we, we sort of, you can do this with various measures up here, but in particular, one specification is very clear about that. Um, they all turn positive, although not statistically significantly so. But here in, the, in this in this uh, graph, you actually get at the zero dollar bound a reasonably large positive statistical significant effect. For if you sort of look at infl people with uh, um, with inflation expectations that are sort of within 0.5 percentage point of actual realized inflation, and if you combine compare them with down here, which is the outside that couldn't make that connection then it's actually statistically significantly negative. So to us, this is a hint that who are these people? So it's not enough that you are college educated or have higher income. But those are the people who are, I call them the CNNBC uh, guys. Those are the guys who actually are the Wall Street guys, the Wall Street Journal guys, the FT guys, that read business news, that are tuned in, that get more or less inflation right. And they seem to understand or they seem to behave in a way our standard economic models would suggest. The, all the others, they tend not to do, okay?
Okay, that's sort of another another. Uh, uh, and this this was the only, in a sense, cross-sectional heterogeneity we found that mattered. It neither age nor cohort uh, nor income nor education. None of this really mattered. Okay. Okay. So here, let me give you sort of step back and give me the interpretation of the, what I view as the interpretation of these results. Oh, I didn't show you that, but sort of the other thing we find, agents do actually respect, uh, uh, respond as expected to subjective nominal interest rates. So th there is an effect like if you expect interest rates to go up, you'd rather buy durables now. You rather want to lock in a, a cheap uh, loan right now. But that's perfectly there. Um, and it's, again, to see the number is, uh, is on uh, a previous slide. They also respond negatively to the mortgage rate in the housing regression, so they, they totally to the current mortgage rate, um, uh, which is exactly you know what 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 simple economics would tell you. So maybe there is an, what I call a behavioral argument, something like nominal interest rate illusion. In other words, they do understand nominal but not real interest rates when it comes to inflation. They also understand relative prices, right? Uh, we talked about this in the context of the housing price uh, uh, regression. Um, but, you know, in any case, but they don't seem to be understanding inflation expectations more generally, and the question is, would they understand it as a policy instrument, okay? Um, it would, at, we argue that at least our results suggest that this is a tough communication problem for central bankers, if they want to use this as a policy instrument. And basically, this is also suggested uh, or, 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 or corrobor corroborated by our finding about the good inflation forecasters, which are the informed households. So we basically say it's not impossible to do that, but you better get everyone on board and make sure everyone knows about it if that's what you want to do for stabilization policy. On the other hand, which is sort of an interesting, maybe more uh, you know, academic corollary out of our results, old, old Keynesianism, which is all about quantity expectations, right? It's all about quantities and quantity expectations, about income, how my income is going to be, whether I'm going to be unemployed or not. They seem to be working just the way we think they work. Okay. Um, okay. We argue careful with inflation. There could be data issues, of course. Okay. Uh, it could also be that Asians haven't, when we did the estimation, haven't really understood the mechanics of monetary policy at the zero lower bound. Okay especially since they were coming from a long period of low inflation and low inflation volatility. So it makes some time to, to, to change this. Or, but we can't really test this directly for the United States, it could be that the, the, the channel is really about investment and not consumption demand, okay? That firms are more sophisticated, more in tune with economic news, and that's, that's what really, uh, that's how stabilization policy really works. And we, we obviously can do nothing about this, okay? And so there's an interesting older time series literature that's older about that that also finds the Restat papers high inflation expectations lead to lower durable goods spending. Um, and Burke and Wernicke in 1975 uh, found that high infl uh, expected inflations actually lead to increases in the national in uh, savings rate and not vice not vice versa as, as would be standard in neo Keynesian thinking. And sort of in the wake of our lit of our paper, there's been a bit of micro literature sort of revisiting our results. So Berg and Ostali, they basically broadly confirm uh, our results um, with actual spending data from a subset of the New York uh, uh, Fed survey on, 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 on consumer expectations. Interestingly enough, for Japan, these two guys uh, find that households have a positive sign. So they, they do not confirm the results for Japan. Um, the hypothesis I have is that these people have long lived essentially under a zero low bound regime, so they should be more equipped to understand the mechanics of monetary policy um, at that, in such a situation. Another big criticism, obviously, that you can level against our paper, and probably the reason why I didn't make, why we had to go to an AJ policy rather than a top five, um, you know, is we, there's nothing, there's no notion of causality. At the end of the day, what we can do is, it's all about, um, you know, it's all about uh, 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 statistical association, correlations, if you wish. And this is where this paper by uh, uh, Dakunto, Huang, and Weber comes in, uh, which I think is a, is, a, is a very nice paper, although it essentially contradicts my, uh, my re old results, as I will argue. Um, they've used a pre-announced 
that increase in Germany to instrument increases in inflation expectations. So they have a clear idea of where actually variations in inflation expectations come from. Okay. I apologize if you can hear a phone ringing in the background. Uh, I'm not going to take it. Um, and so they are much more about causality. Okay. They use, uh, again, consumer survey data. And so the German government had basically engineered, unbeknownst to them, but they ended up engineering a sort of a relatively surprise increase, a pre-announced uh, surprise increase in the VAT, in the, in the German VAT, by 3%. This was uh, after a new uh, government was elected in, uh, in November 2005. They basically said, come January 2007, but goes up. Okay? And um, the, it, is, it was a surprise because the pre-election promise was not to, change, uh, not to increase the VAT or raise, for that matter, any tax. Um, and so what they show neatly, though they have a nice uh, sort of control, control group, if you look at other European countries, inflation expectations didn't go up in the service. Only in the German survey, it went indeed up after the pre-announcement of the VAT, okay? Which is also neat because now you can sort of exclude sort of uh, idiosyncratic monetary policy issues here because Germany and these other European countries were part of the same monetary policy zone the Eurozone. They look, I believe, at Sweden and, and France. Okay. Um, and therefore, certainly there was no Taylor rule effect that somehow the ECB would actually react to these increased inflation expectations concentrated in Germany. Okay. So it's a, it's a relatively clean natural experiment. And here's, here you can see this. This is inflation expectations between announcement and increase. And I mean, the effect is kind of obvious, right? You can see it here. It just spikes and then it essentially also goes back here to, to pre-announcement levels once, once the VAT increase then actually happens, okay? This is a very clean uh, natural experiment, and they find indeed, if you instrument, if you use this as an instrument here, that uh, uh, readiness to spend relative to other European countries, this is really a different diff exercise, spiked during that time, and then fell back to normal after the actual implementation. So they call this paper uh, sort of a test of really unconventional fiscal policy, which is sort of pre-announcement of VATs, which, by the way, has been discussed also for Greece um, uh, in, during the crisis, and they argue that it works, okay? So now, how do I think about this, okay, in light of my own, in light of my own uh, U.S. evidence, okay? So there's no question that this paper is much better on causality that, because of this very clean experiment, and they do a lot to convince the reader that, that you have a clean natural experiment here. Um, still, so what do I think about it? Okay, the first thing is, indeed, these people, like the Japanese, um, have much longer experience than the United States of living in a situation with exogenal, exogenally fixed nominal monetary policy rates. So that's because they've been living in a monetary union for different reasons, right? They've been living in a monetary union. The Japanese have li been living long for at a zero lower bound or close to the zero lower bound. And the other thing I think that experiment teaches us, of course, an announced VAT after an election, prior to which it was promised to not raise a tax, that's like the mother of all salience issues, right? I mean, this is like as salient a policy measure as you can make it. Everyone was talking about it in Germany. This, does, this is very different often from monetary policy, where, you know, what the Federal Open Market Committee, if there's an interview uh, process, very few and only the specialists pay attention to it. And we showed for those that are likely to be people paying attention to macroeconomic news, the, the, the channel is alive as well, in which case I would argue there's not much of, a, of actually so big a difference or discrepancy between the two results, okay? So we need to be careful in interpreting these results. And, and the, at the end of the day, uh, what, it, uh, what, it, uh, what it amounts to, what these sort of two, and again, their paper is also a survey paper, an inflation expectations survey uh, uh, paper, um, it, it really amounts uh, to um, if central banks want to use this tool, they need to think about clear and loud salient uh, conversation of that policy and what they're trying to achieve with it, okay? Maybe this is trivial and this is what practitioners would say anyway, but sort of just taking the neo-Keynesian mechanism for granted, I don't think that's a too, too naive view of the world. Anyway, that's sort of the, the big picture I take from taking these papers and all the other papers that have been written in the wake of our paper on this issue uh, sort of in conjunction. Um, all right, so as I said, um, taking stock for the second part, 
We have seen that microdata on inflation expectations in particular helps us test a key part of an important stabilization policy mechanism, and it tells us to conduct the management of inflation expectations, uh, or how to conduct is, uh, them, namely that communication and salience seem key. Okay. Um, so that's a, that concludes the second part, and again, I'm willing to pause now here in case you have questions. Again, if you verbalize questions, we can switch the, 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 the technical setup. And um, if you want to indulge me maybe for another 15 minutes or so, uh, I can talk about sort of potential next steps and, you know, what, what else I'm working on with uh, uh, sort of sub, uh, subjective data. Okay, now I seem to have lost control over the presentation. Oh. Oh, I see. Got you. Okay, I'm I'm reading it now. Sorry, apologize. Um Oh, I see, and I, I agree with that. The que sort of what we would need then, obviously, would be sort of surveys um, that both get at expectations and, for example, lending conditions for households, how financially constrained they are, for example. That is um, that is something that would be survey heaven. I would agree with that, and uh, um, I guess central banks could be one of the and this is really just appealing to you guys and, and anyone else who hears me in the central bank community, um, it would be nice to, to have such uh, data available. Yeah. Um, right now, I, th I think this is tricky to sort of, yeah, in some sense, I, if, if I understood Alberto correctly, to disentangle the expectation uh, issue or the information processing issue from the, from the, the frictions issue, the financial frictions issue. Um, yes. But I, I think this is an obviously an important question. Um, okay. Okay, so again, always in, um, um, interrupt me as, uh, if I move to the, uh, when I move to the last uh, and, and third part of the, of the presentation. Um, sort of, you know, and this is basically why I said um, um, in, in the title of the paper is, and we haven't even started yet because I will now push the agenda even further and say not, expectations are useful, but not, and, and I hope I demonstrated to you if you haven't believed, if you ha didn't believe it anyway, um, uh, why these expectations uh, data are useful in macroeconomics. I will now go further and argue that, you know, other data from surveys, um, 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 that's an interesting question. Uh, financial literacy programs, whether they improve the information of expectations. Um, I'm not an expert on, finan on the financial literacy uh, literature, um, how much that is. My, my understanding from what I know is that a lot of these interventions, these micro-interventions have, um, have, uh, uh, have not necessarily been super successful. And um, quite frankly, if I sometimes look at my own investment decisions, I ask myself, Am I am I really a professional economist? You know, so <laughs> there's there's that issue too. Um, but um, I think I would take more stock in sort of uh, in thinking about how extraordinary extraordinary situations that require extraordinary monetary policy, how to sort of be out and about upfront um, uh, in terms of communication. I think that's the, that's the lesson I draw from sort of from my, from, from, from my research, uh, together with, 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 that, uh, with that fiscal, uh, this, uh, this VAT experiment. I think that's just uh, a super important. And, uh, and uh, again, I'm not an expert in central bank communication, but that's something I think central banks need to be mindful of. Uh, uh, yeah. 
Okay, so let's move on here. Um, and um, this is from a paper, this is still a working paper, what drives aggregate investments actually now 2017, um, but uh, evidence from German survey data. So very quickly, I don't want to keep you for too long, so I will rush through this a bit. So what do we do in this paper? We tackle an old question, namely what the heck drives aggregate fluctuations, and particularly in this paper, investment fluctua fluctuations, and even more specifically, fluctuations of the year-over-year -year investment growth rate. Okay, that's what this paper is about. And we use sort of a quasi-narrative survey-based approach. So we have data from E4 survey from a manufacturing investment survey. We focus on West Germany, simply so we have a consistent time series, about t determinants of investment. So in the fall of every year, decision makers in a firm are being asked uh, what issues, and they can choose from six, determined uh, investment activity in the current but ending year, and to what extent uh, it did so on an ordinal scale, okay? And so we use these micro data, aggregate they up or semi-aggregate them up to extract things like technology shocks, non-technology shocks, other things, okay? So we move from investment determinants to shocks. And we do this in two steps. The first sort of more broadly, technology versus non-technology, with a minimal set of assumptions that we put a bit more uh, assumptions on there, and then we also will extract something like aggregate demands and finance shocks. So what's nice about this is that it's basically we're using data that are based on the subjective um, uh, impression of why of investors in a firm um, on why they did something. Okay. Um, and this is a bit similar. I view this as a bit similar, although different. I mean, Roma and Roma, is, as you know, is all about uh, uh, is about narrative approaches for policy. What policymakers thought they were doing. Um, I'm, uh, we are basically using a similar idea but for first, okay? I should say also these data are highly confidential. In not, not, researchers can get them, but it's not widely spread. So there's not sort of a, an issue of strategically lying to signal something to the market or something, okay? So what we find, just to give you the results if I don't get to the end, on average in the long run, it seems that technological considerations are the most important investment determinant in the survey. I tend to interpret this as a very neoclassical result. So on average, if you abstract from fluctuations, that seems to be what's mostly always going on, okay? But in terms of the fluctuation, actually, it's um, these technology shocks, these identified technology shocks, explain only roughly one-third of the variance in aggregate investments. And it's more, it's more the demand shocks, something we'll argue looks often like sentiment shocks that explains investment, okay? You can also do a historical analysis, we can find, which are very consistent with uh, the historical narrative. For example, the boom in the 1990s, sort of everyone talks about the tech boom uh, there, and the slump in the early 2000s, which is where Germany was called the sick man of Europe because of all manner of distortions, uh, seem to be related to more t supply side, technological factors, if you wish, okay, um, in a broad sense. But, but the recovery from the slump in the later half of the 2000s looks like a, clearly a, a sentiment shock, and I'll show you this. I hope you all get to this. Interestingly enough, the Great Recession looks actually like a combination of a sentiment shock and negative sentiment shock, but also there is a significant technological slowdown. So some background on the survey. There's a semi-annual survey, spring and fall, with slightly different questions. It's manufacturing. Principally, it starts in 1955, but electronically it's available from 1989 on, and in any way, these investment determinant uh, questions only start uh, then, okay? Um, yeah, okay, and we start our sort of, we, the first pass we do, the first sample we do, we exclude the Great Recession, because we want to focus on year to average sort of regular business cycle fluctuations. So we have a large number of observations, uh, over 30,000 uh, firm year observations altogether. It turns out, I'll show you the picture, that the, that, that survey, that investment survey, is super well correlated with official aggregate investment data, and this is not by construction, because aggregate investment data actually are, are gathered from a different survey, an independent and different survey, okay? On top of what the question, what did you actually invest in the firm, you know, they also have questions about investment determinants and, and other, and other uh, questions about the investment. The drawback is, of course, the annual frequency that gives us not, enough, not as much time series as we would like to have, um, but we do overcome this by using sort of disaggregate data, sectoral uh, uh, we run also sectoral specifications that add a bit more variation on that front. So we get some of the identification then also cross-sectionally. This is a survey, basically 
sort of gross fixed capital information. Um, and then here do you have these basically these investment determinants and then you can cross strongly positive, weakly positive, weakly negative, strongly negative influence, technical factors, micro policy environment, profit expectations, finance, sales situation. That's basically what you can what what the the, the they can choose. All right. Um, and we quantify them. We obviously have to put them into numbers to aggregate them up. And here's what we do. Basically, we um, we we compute uh, an investment share uh, uh, for the firm, for a given firm, and then we aggregate up the uh, their investment, the change of investment, the investment investment growth rate, compute an aggregate investment growth rate for the EFO survey, and we do the same for each of the of the these determinants. Okay. Uh, which is denoted by XIT. So here are a bunch of data. The first thing I want to show you is that the EFO investment growth rate is highly correlated with the growth rate from from uh, uh, NIPA data, or the German equivalent of NIPA data, okay, 0.91. And here's what these aggregate investment determinant indices look like. And in some sense, you can see the, the, the thrust of the paper already there. In the sense that tech, okay, is always high, but it doesn't seem to fluctuate. So in that sense, tech is always important for the firms to determine their investment, but it doesn't seem to be cyclically as sort of strongly fluctuating as sales. Okay? Also, you know, other is essentially noise. We are fairly confident about that. Finance, you can see, and this might be different from the United States, finance on average doesn't play much of a role. It's always around zero for these firms which has a lot to do with sort of German firms still tend to finance sort of uh, internally, which, by the way, doesn't necessarily mean that finance or financial frictions are not important for the German economy. I would argue they are in the sense that a lot of firms are still forced to uh, finance uh, uh, their investments internally, just save up for them because they can't really borrow. But that's more of a long-run permanent phenomenon of the United States, uh, of, of German economy. But there doesn't seem to be much uh, sort of fluctuations over the cycle. And there's something similar sort of for the macro policy environment. And you can see this also here. This is sort of a, a split of the data where you sort of the, the black line is the, the zero. It played no role whatsoever, uh, for example, right? And then uh, the, the, uh, the, the blue diamond line is medium positive influence. I, I, uh, you know, you can look at the details, but basically what this also shows, again, that finance for most of the firms just played a neutral role or ne didn't change uh, much over the cycle. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. And this is basically just a correlation table uh, that correlates some of these investment determinant series with, with aggregate investment growth. Unfortunately for us, these are highly correlated with each other. Okay. And so, you know, we can't just take them, you know, these, these determinants literally uh, as, as shocks because we want shocks to be orthogonal. So, you know, we need to do something later. But before we do that, let me go through a few things that, you know, is, as opposed to convince you that, you know, that some of the, the economic content of these, of, of these determinants is actually, is actually what they're supposed to mean. For example, we have uh, data also in this survey on the fraction of investment that went into restructuring and rationalization. And we correlate that with uh, tech. Okay, and it's pretty clear that the more, uh, so that the more, the bigger your content of investment in restructuring and in rationalization, the higher your tech number was, the more important tech contributed to your investment strategy in a given year. We can also find this now at the sectoral level. We can split up industries by the uh, technology content, which is a, uh, a classification from Eurostat. And again, you see those, fir uh, those firms in sectors with a high technology uh, uh, content tend to have higher uh, uh, tech as an answer. Okay. The other thing we have done, which is not yet in the paper, but which is really nice, we actually matched the investment survey with the pricing survey that's also at the EFO and found that tech is negatively con uh, correlated with price increases and positively correlated with price decreases and exactly vice versa for sales. So a simple supply, you know, supply and uh, demand argument uh, uh, sort of holds up in the survey. That's kind of a neat, uh, again, determination. This is finance. This simply shows that, um, you know, firms, first of all, again, you can see most firms in Germany have a very small share of external finance, okay? And 
the one that have a higher one, you can see they tend to, for them, finance is, is on average the, the more important. So again, it passes, finance passes this, uh, this sort of uh, sanity check, okay? So now what we do, we proceed in two, in two steps. First, we argue, let's give technology sort of, in some sense, the most bang for the buck. Basically, we say technological advances are author contemporaneously orthogonal to everything else. They're determined by engineering efforts, engineering luck. And we sort of order this series in a Koletsky-type uh, thinking first. Okay? And then within the technology stocks, we're going to orthogonalize profit, macro, and other uh, at the end, because we argue in the paper, I haven't shown you this, that they're essentially not independent series. They're statistically essentially uh, um, something that's captured by either technology, finance, and sales, or a convex combination of those. Okay. Um, and, then, um, and then sort of within the remaining, uh, the remaining group, basically, we orthogonalize finance with respect to sales, simply because external finance doesn't seem to be too, super important. We do it also the other way around. It doesn't make much of a difference for our results. Okay? So basically, this is simply uh, uh, an or the or orthogonalization regression. We also uh, verify that the orthogonalized series are not autocorrelated. Okay? So th they really look like shocks then. And then what we do, the final regression that's basically um, uh, uh, almost the result, is um, the final regression, we simply regress aggregate um, from NIPA data, from independent, from the German NIPA data, um, investment growth on these orthogonalized investment determinants. Tax sales, that's what the hat means, orthogonalization, finance, and so on and so forth. The nice thing, if you remember your mechanics of all less regressions, if, if, the, if the regressors are all exogenous, you can basically have a nice variance decomposition or a nice R squared co uh, decomposition, because uh, the R squared is simply the, uh, the summation of the R squared of the individual univariate regressions. Um, okay. By the way, the residuals of that regression also don't play, uh, display significant autocorrelation. So here's the result. Two things I want to hammer home. Um, the first one is 84% R squared. So we are capable of explaining with this stupid subjective survey data, you know, most of the overwhelming majority of aggregate investment fluctuations in Germany from a data set that's completely independent um, um, from the E4 survey, okay? I think that's remarkable. So this means that these things are not noise. They actually have content, okay? Uh, and something that I didn't necessarily ex expect. We show also in more disaggregate regressions, the R squared go down a bit, um, um, but not all that much. So we have still pretty good uh, R squared if we do that as a state level in Germany or the or the, or the industry level, the two-digit industry level. And here's the R squared. Um, the R squared tells you that, uh, the R squared decomposition, it tells you that roughly 30% of the, of the R squared is explained um, uh, by the, uh, of the 84% is basically explained by tech, and over half of it explained by uh, sales, uh, what we'll end up calling demand shocks, and then the rest is basically ne negligible. Okay. You can do counterfactuals historical counterfactuals. Um, I'll just pick something a bit out. You know, you can see, by the way, you want to you wanna compare basically the, the black and the red line. The black line is the fitted, the, the blue line is the actual, but sort of, you know, the, the, the difference between those, that's just what we cannot explain with our regression. So if you compare by the, the black and, the, and, the, and the, the, the red line, you see finance, taking out finance doesn't do any difference at all to what we can explain. But you can see, leaving out sales, um, it's pretty clear that you know this one here was a, a negative aggregate demand shock, okay. And you can also see here that you know without the positive, uh, uh, um, without the positive boom from the demand side, investment would have been much lower. Conversely, you can see technology without sort of this slump, this Euro uh, Germany being the sick man of Europe type of episode. Um, you know, uh, uh, investment would have been much higher than it actually was. Okay. So this gives you sort of, this is squares our results historically square with a lot of the narratives we have seen. Okay. We do a lot of robustness checks, which I don't want to talk about here. Um, you, if you're interested, you can read the paper yourself. Um, basically, we control for spillover effects between sectors, you know, uh, we run a VAR, we do this in a VAR, we show disaggregate results for lender and two-digit industries. 
He controls the leads and lags of the text series to capture news effects, adjustment friction. Um, so we do many, many, many things uh, in there. And, uh, you know, the results are fairly robust. The results are fairly robust. Uh, and this is just to show you a correlation graph between what we call the aggregate demand shock and some of these, uh, uh, some of the sentiment indices, consumer sentiment and, 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 um, and business sentiments. And you can clearly see that they are highly correlated with each other. So overall, although we basically know in the 90s, we know from sort of independent historical narrative evidence, it was clearly a negative monetary policy shock because the Bundesbank wanted to curb on the, on the reunification boom and inflation uh, heating up. But we, you know, the rest sort of, of the regular uh, fluctuations, we actually find um, uh, that, it's, that these look pretty much like sentiment uh, movements. Let me skip that, uh, that slide and uh, try to finish on time, I hope. So, you know, I would argue subjective survey data are back on the map. And um, maybe I'm preaching to the choir here, but maybe I gave you some arguments and discussions. <clears throat> I think especially expectation data have a lot to teach us about important macroeconomic ideas and issues. Um, I would argue we can and should go a step further and ask economic agents why they did what they did. Okay? We don't necessarily need to take it at face, face value, but as I've argued, there are ways to test what they're actually saying and whether it's consistent what we think as economists they're saying, and uh, we should use this information. Okay? Um, and... Uh, yeah, and sort of, I gave you sort of one example of this idea of looking at subjective reasons, uh, sort of attitudinal or reasons data, to study a very old age uh, question in economics, namely what are what are ultimate business cycle, uh, what drives ultimately aggregate fluctuations. All right, that's uh, from me. Again, I apologize for the technical difficulties. I still had a lot of fun <laughs> because no one interrupted me, like, like my undergrads, um, okay. but. Maybe um, I'm happy to switch now to uh, to the uh, to the other mic, um, and then uh, people can, if they want, take questions. Uh, So there, can you hear us, Rudy? Okay. So you you were you were saying here, ask people about why they did what they did, uh, but don't take it as at face value. And are there ways to to really? For example, contrast uh, uh, these reports and actual uh, decisions. And are there people that have done that? And, and how much they they diverge? Okay, I've switched uh, again. Um, so um, you should hear me now. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, well, again, I would, I would say two things. The first thing is that, you know, just at a basic statistical level, these things have explanatory power. They have an incredible explanatory power. I mean, just this stupid stuff explains, essentially, German aggregate investment fluctuation from an independent survey, right? I think that, that, that is something that we just can't ignore. So now the question is sort of, is when they say technical reasons were important for my investment decision, right? Um, um, do we, you know, do we mean, do they mean the same what we have in mind or what do they have in mind? So that, and that's a fair question and we have been worried about that. And again, what we're trying to do in the paper much more than I showed you here is really try to, especially with the technical stuff, really correlate that with many other questions in the survey that they answer, like the restructuring question. We look, is this correlated? Maybe be, also if you think about that it's also so permanent is also always important. People have one that maybe all they're really saying is maintenance. This is just regular maintenance and uh, maintenance is really what they interpret. So they interpret technology as maintenance, right? And that's just simply not the case. In fact, it's the opposite. We show in the paper that 
a high degree of maintenance basically is correlated with a lower uh, uh, importance of technology. And so the pricing, the pricing evidence we, we, we bring to bear. So there are many bits and pieces we sort of where we cross check some of this stuff uh, with other survey data uh, that make me believe at least that there's something there. Of course, will I will I ever convince a, a super diehard skeptic? Probably not. And God knows uh, I've meet, met those skeptics. Um, but you know I think it's just useful information. Um, and uh, uh, that we that we you know we, sh we should probably look at. And the, the problem, of course, if you in, try to introduce a new measure into economics, you always you know if people if you find that you know it makes a lot of sense, in the sense that we we we, we also find what other people have found, and in the end people say ah it makes sense, but we don't really need it because we knew that already. We can do this with the old measures. But then if you don't if you don't find something that's sort of consistent with the old the old evidence and you find actually something new, they will say, oh, we don't believe your new measure, right? So it's like this is sort of this tension in, in, in the ac academic publishing game uh, that, that's just terrible in some sense, right? So I don't know. <laughs> so you, you have to be somewhere in between. I would argue we are somewhere in between, but uh, others have to be the judge, the judge. So I will switch again to the other mode and... Uh, and uh, I can hear you now. Uh, as you know, uh, there will be many, many papers that are going to be developing in this network related to uh, this part. So these are some of the titles. So perhaps as, as, they, as they progress, I'll send you, I'll send you the, the output so that if you want to just take a look at it and you find anything interesting you you could do it oh, uh, can you hear me now yeah again i switched so yeah no i would love to obviously i this is dear to my heart i think expectational data obviously i think i made that clear i'm important and you know uh, seeing this stuff uh, being done uh, across the world right now let's face it we have a we have really um, and this is the, the you know, the, 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 both the advantage but also the disadvantage of being in, a, in, in the United States, of having such a large economy, you know, with exceptional data, literally the best data in the world for most uh, things. But we tend to be a bit too U.S. centrist and U.S. focused in our, in both our research, but also what we like to publish, right? And so, as I said, this inflation expectations issue, we, we, we have some studies about Germany, we have some studies uh, obviously about the United States, Japan, obviously Japan is an interesting case because of the zero low bound episodes, but we need much more obviously, right? We need, uh, we need to know this from many countries in the world to really say a lot, and we also I bet there, would be, there will be interesting heterogeneities. Um, in that sense, uh, I would love to hear more about you know some of these some of these uh, uh, papers that that look at, at experiences in other countries. I think that's part of the next step to go. Thank you. Well, we'll keep you back on, on how things uh, evolve with the research network. If you in any way Thank you. want to be involved, that that would be that would be great. Uh, so if there there are no other questions, uh, I'll. I would like to thank uh, Udir Bachman in, in, on behalf of everyone who attended today. And uh, in, the, in the next couple of days, we are going to be posting the seminars that we are going to be having in, in the next uh, month related to this research network. So thank you very much, Udir. Thank you to all who participated today. Thank you. Good day. Okay.